in any case, I'm going to give you what is a very personal view of our collective struggle to overcome human immunodeficiency virus, which causes AIDS. And this goes back for me a long time. I started working in this area in 1987. Uh, and we've been in and out, and we suddenly find ourselves over the last year or so back in the game. It's somewhat unusual to be able to be involved in an area of research so long that this thing's moved so quickly now. But as you will find out, uh, HIV is not a simple pathogen. It has evolutionary advantages which we find very difficult to deal with. Documented case, at least in this country, not more of. 
Okay. Now this is a quotation from the Center for Disease Control website. As many as 50, 150,000 people became effective each year. The rate had dropped to 40,000 in a year where it remains today, unfortunately. Uh, more people than ever are living with AIDS, or HIV. And that's a real problem. We have roughly a million people in this country who are HIV positive, or are being actively treated for AIDS and suppressing the disease. The problem is only about a quarter of these people know that they're HIV positive. And therefore, that's why we have 40,000 new people infected every year. So it's a, it's a real burden. And it's somewhat ironic because in many ways, age is a social disease. And obviously, abstinence is a cure. That doesn't seem to be effective in any culture that I'm aware of. And again, this is just to tell you things that you probably already know, that you don't get AIDS casually. It has to be active contact. The virus is transmitted through semen, vaginal fluid, and blood. So you have to be exposed to those. I mean, obviously, if you were a child, you can get it through breast milk and so on. Here's something else that most people are not aware of. We lost a whole generation of patients who were hemophiliacs. These are people who had defects in being able to coagulate their blood. They were people who required either transfusions or clotting factors on a regular basis in order not to bleed to death. From the beginning of the AIDS infections up until 19 blood supply in this country was contaminated with HIV. Practically every patient who was a hemophiliac contracted AIDS. There was no recompense. The company that produced the blood products were protected by law from any sort of recovery of these people of the enhanced costs. I think it's one of the at least to be one of the major tragedies. And again, it's something that has not made it uh, into the public view. Okay, so here, here's the politicians that enter the picture. Okay. In 2004, we realized AIDS is a worldwide epidemic. We need to do something to help those countries who don't have the medical facilities that we have, who don't have access to the drugs, who don't have HMOs and healthcare and insurance and so on to provide patients with the therapy they use. And so we started distributing assistance in Africa, Latin America, et cetera, for treatment of AIDS. And, and by 19, by 2007, over a million people in the world were receiving our assistance in terms of growth and so on. However, for those of you who are familiar with how late politicians came to the scene, I would recommend, if you're not familiar, that you get from your Netflix or whatever, a particular movie called And the Band Played On. It talks about how we basically ignored the fact that we had an epidemic, because the people who were the primary carriers of that epidemic were homosexuals. To DNA is performed by the viral enzyme reverse transcriptase. Drugs that interfere with this process are called reverse transcriptase inhibitors, or RTIs, and include the nucleoside and non nucleoside RTIs. The newly transcribed viral DNA is then incorporated into the cellular genome by the viral enzyme integrase. Following integration, the viral genome is transcribed into mRNA and transported from the nucleus back into the cytoplasm. In the cytoplasm, viral mRNA undergoes translation, resulting in the production of viral proteins. Four proteins are produced as long polypeptide chains that must be cleaved into smaller proteins in order to become functional. This step is performed by the viral protease enzyme which is the target of the antiviral drugs known as protease inhibitors. Some 
functional viral proteins and viral RNA that assemble in the cell membrane, and ultimately, new viruses are released in a process called viral budding. Why do we have this problem? We have this problem because the viral reproduces 
virus reproduces its genetic material over and over again inside the cell. All right? That reverse transcriptase has a mutation rate that's about a thousand times what we have. So if you're going to reproduce so many viruses in the cell, each cell, and you're going to do that with a fairly high frequency on the order of minutes to hours, okay, it means you have the chances of changing the entire expressed protein in terms of its component of amino acids by mutation. So the virus that survives the drug is the one that's resistant. And you just run a selective, an evolutionary selective experiment, experiment to, su to suck out those uh, viruses which are resistant. This happens to be one of my favorite slides. Because for one of the few times in my life, a scientist made the cover as Time Man of the Year. Uh, this is pretty unusual. It's David Ho, who was the first person, I think, who really pushed the idea of combining different types of therapeutics against AIDS. And the thought is really very, very simple. It says that if I'm targeting this enzyme, reverse transcriptase, and I'm targeting HIV protease, okay, in order for the patient to get, to get out of control of his virus, for the virus to start expressing itself, I have to have a mutant, mutant in both proteins. And suppose I give him two different reverse transcriptase drugs, which require different mutations. Right? Suddenly, the probability that that patient is going to start expressing the HIV virus and develop AIDS is less. This has been a tremendous amount. This started in 1995 when the protease inhibitors became available to supplement reverse transcriptase. And as I said, unfortunately, this does not eliminate the disease. All it does is basically suppress the expression of the virus. Okay, so what have we accomplished? We cut the deaths from AIDS by two-thirds since 1995. We have, we got resistance developing. You know, I'm sure you all know about MRSA. The fact that if you want to get really sick, you go to a hospital. Because that's where we have the really drug-resistant strains of bacteria, staph, strep, you name it. Uh, it's unfortunate that that's true. And you know, unfortunately, for a period of about 20 years, the pharmaceutical industry more developed new antibiotics. I mean, I can actually, I don't have it with me, but there's a quotation I have somewhere from the head of NIH or something saying that there is no need for new uh, anti infectives or antibacterial drugs. <laughs> so let's talk about the good thing. Let's talk about the science. What has the things that we've learned to deal with, hopefully this summer, some of you, have contributed? And 83 people really got serious. It was very clear that this is a totally different disease, that something had to be done. People started working on it, particularly a group in France and a group at NIH. Uh, the complete sequence of the HIV genome was done at NIH in 1985. It's very clear you could identify which parts of the genome produced uh, coded proteins. So we knew the ensemble sequences of proteins that the virus made. Uh, a Japanese group noticed that there was one particular protein that had a three amino acid sequence, a spiral three amino glycine. That's really very diagnostic. If you're in the enzyme inhibitor business, that says a spiral proteinase. You know, we have lots of different uh, enzymes in our body. Renin, for example, which is involved in hypertension, which is in spiral protease. But it has two DTG motifs in it. This was puzzling because this was a little small protein, 99 residues on the one DTG unit. And a lot of people just said, you can't possibly have anything to do with it. A group at Merck basically mutated the aspartic acid to an alanine, killed the virus dead in the water, 
suddenly a lot of us, myself included, was saying, I know an awful lot about osteoporosis. I've worked on renin, I've worked on some other enzyme inhibitors in this family. We can take all that knowledge and target HIV protease. Well, uh, <laughs> that's really nice, but first you have to get the enzyme. I can tell you that one of the best groups in the world, who happened to be at Monsanto at the time, that had within six months produced any hormone, human growth hormone, any targeted enzyme. They spent three years cloning and expressing HIV protease. In the interim, we started working on a synthetic protease uh, made by Steve Kim. And, um, Okay, so here is the current status. We now have crystal structures of every protein that's expressed by the HIV. Every one. Okay. You could not ask for a more complete three-dimensional diagram of targets. But with each one of those targets comes the liability of resistance. Doesn't matter what you target, the virus has the capability of making a mutation, making variants which walk away from your drug. Okay, so let me talk about how you target the spiral proteases. This is this is quite intriguing to me, and if I, you know, if your chemistry is not up to snuff, there will not be a pop quiz at the end of my talk. You will not have to reproduce the structures. Okay. But in any case, this is a structure of a natural product. It was isolated a long time ago in Japan by a natural products chemist called Umazawa from the bacteria. They had an incredible group of natural product chemists isolating things out of fermentation walls against every possible thing you could think of. Uh, I saw a poster about ancient gene coa reductase and statins. Statins came out of this sort of isolation procedures and so on. In any case, what was funny about this was it had this funny almost amino acid, you see, which is circled in red. That's called statine. And it basically, instead of having a carbonyl, like a peptide would, or an amino acid would, it has a hydroxyl. So at that position, okay, it has a, an alcohol, a tetrahedral carbon with an alcohol, but a carbonyl, which is plainer. Linus Pauling, uh, many years ago, and you may not believe this, but I'm old enough that Linus Pauling taught me freshman chemistry. I really am that old. <laughs> you know. uh, my wife keeps me, you know, at least presentable. In any case, he said, enzyme catalysis is based on stabilization of the transition state. That is, when I take a product and I interact with the enzyme, excuse me, I take a substrate, interact with the enzyme and it goes to a product, the way that enzyme makes it go faster is by it interacts with the intermediate, that geometrical change that goes on, okay, and helps make the transition, lowers the activation energy verification. Well, that basically leads one to the conclusion that if one can make a chemical that looks like that transition state, it should bind to the active site tighter than the substrate. One of the things that amuses me sometimes is people ask me, well, evolutions have generations upon them, you know, millennia upon millennia, however you want to talk about it, to come up with all these solutions to problems, to make things bind really well to fit in you know, the substrate of the same. The answer to that is nature does not optimize affinity. Nature optimizes rates. If your neurotransmitter acetylcholine bounds your muscle input as tightly as it could, okay, we would all be paralyzed. That acetylcholine has to go on, do its job, come off, and get hyperlyzed. So we can send another drug. So this is one of the gimmicks, one of the little tricks that physical chemists have learned to play with enzymes. We know how to beat you at your game. 
and I don't know whether you can see this or not, it really doesn't matter. Here are two different protease inhibitors come from a substrate of the, the, of the uh, pro polyprotein, right? which both have this tetrahedral alcohol in that particular position. Both of them are excellent HIV protease inhibitors. One of them actually is the first HIV protease inhibitor. Uh, and so on. So, you know, that's a trick. And if you look at all of the HIV protease the one that everybody has made, the nine that have made it to the clinic or whatever, all of them have that tetrahedral carbon mimicking the transition state. They're all transition state animals. Now, this for me is a very, still is, when I look at it, a very exciting picture. This was the first crystal structure. It's a diagrammatic view of the complex between HIV protease and an inhibitor. That is a picture off the screen of the first time that was ever shown. The compound actually was made by Mahaley B. Toth in my laboratory, affectionately known in our group as MBT101. Crystal structure was done by Maria Miller at the NCI, and the structure was published in Science. And I just found out within the last two years that my colleague Alex Lodauer, who ran the NCI lab, was giving that structure away to every major pharmaceutical company before the paper was published, because we all agreed that we were not, you know, we were not paid by NIH, paid by you taxpayers. I'm not in this for commercial gain. AIDS is a big problem, that information should be out there. So every major pharmaceutical company took this structure and ran with it. <coughs> and there's some things you should know about this structure. First, the colored candy canes. Well, I sort of viewed this as like a Christmas gift, right? Red and green, what other colored candy canes would you have? Okay? It's obviously a dimer. You can see the C2 symmetry running right down here. Okay? The active site of sporadics are right here, that DTG motif is rest on this one and this one. Here's the inhibitor. And look at these guys up here. What you see in all other cases of aspartoproteases I know about is you have two beta hairpins that come down like this, okay, and make a four-stranded beta sheet to tuck in the protein substrate. In this case, much to everyone's surprise, they come in and they go down like that and they interact with the substrate. That is something that no one would have predicted. No matter how sophisticated your computer was or how sophisticated your knowledge of protein chemistry was. And what it really reinforces to me is the fact that theory and experiment are always go hand in hand. Theory generates hypotheses. Hypotheses have to be measured against Okay, so here's another example, and you see, my gosh, this one, which actually comes from a group in Kyoto, uh, binds in exactly the same way. The structure of the protein is exactly the same. There have been probably, I don't know, three, four hundred different examples of complexes of inhibitors with HIV protease. All of them basically generate in the crystal structures exactly the same conformation of the enzyme. Well, that's great. Okay. So all I have to do is drive in a potential chemical compound, see if it likes binding in that site, go to the lab and make it tested. And that was done. Because as you probably know, pharmaceutical companies operate under a strict rule. What you make has to be unique and patentable. So every pharmaceutical company had to come up with solution to this problem. And they did. And it's a good thing because they have different resistance is expressed to the different compounds in different ways. So if we took, and I don't know when this picture was made, but we basically could use the crystal structures of the enzyme that they were the same, and we could align, I don't know, there's probably at least 100 different inhibitors in that place. 
And then we can ask, how much interaction energy do you get from each of those atoms in the inhibitor interacting with the protein? And we could sort of generate a three-dimensional map of where it's going to put a hydroxyl group, where it's going to put a charge group, where it's going to put a metal ring. Right? And then we could ask the computer, go generate another couple of thousand HIV protease members. And we were not the only one doing this. Because as an academic, I don't have the pressure to make unique compounds. But boy, the pharmaceutical industry does. So they were looking for unique solutions, and they found them. Okay, so we come to an issue of virtual screening. If I have a crystal structure of a therapeutic target, right, I can set up high throughput screening. I can generate 50 kilos of HIV protease, and I can set up an assay, and I can run all the millions of compounds that are in Merck or Pfizer or whatever through this assay. And I happen to know, Searle ran 240,000 compounds against HIV protease. They got no hits. Uh, Morgan Lambert ran about 400,000 compounds against HIV protease. They got a hit, and I think was actually developed into a compound. It's totally unique in how the hit was the answer. But in any case, there is a database of 8 million compounds that I can buy commercially. So now what we generally do is if we have a therapeutic target, we'll take this database of 8 million compounds and we'll do what is called docking, we'll do virtual screening, we'll try to dock our compound to see if it hits the space on the enzyme that's important. If it does, we'll order those compounds and test them. The reason I'm telling you this is because the common experience is we only get 20 active compounds for every 100 we test, if the computers told us they're all good. So if you're in the business of coming up with novel compounds, that's 20 leads. That's not bad. Okay. If you're an academic like me, that says I've got 80% false positives. This is supposed to be physics and chemistry. Right? Why do I have false positives? That's been driving me nuts. And only within the last couple of years do I think I've found the answer. I don't like the answer, okay? But it doesn't matter whether I like it or not, I've got to deal with it. And that's what I'm going to tell you about eventually. Okay, so what's the problem we have with people that have AIDS that are on these drugs? The biggest problem we have is patient compliance. All of these drugs have serious side effects. We're just now finding out what some of them are. Uh, they all, the patient, some patients, they will make nauseous to the point that they can't take that particular drug. Used to, if there was somebody who was an AIDS patient, they'd have a schedule. You know, take 10, 10 drugs at 7 a.m., you take, you know, six drugs with breakfast, you take you know, 12 drugs before lunch, you know, and they have this thing like this gallon jar to get them through the week. It's gotten better. The drugs have gotten more potent, therefore we can get less uh, drug. Uh, but still, it's, it's a major burden and it's a major hassle. Because what happens if you're sick, taking the drug is not such a bad deal. It makes you feel better. When you start feeling better and the drug has a negative side effect, chances are you're going to stop taking the drug. So what happens? You have a circulating amount of drug in your body that's insufficient to suppress the virus. So any of the viruses that have a mutation that are resistant to that drug now go up and are selected for it. So we have a wonderful environment for developing resistant mutations. Um, and so right now we're in a situation where we are stuck with trying to come up with new therapeutics on a regular basis. Side effects. Here is a side effect. This is someone who basically, uh, an a a HIV patient, a 
uh, proteasome inhibitors. He's developed what is commonly, uh, effectively would be the same as type 2, type 2 diabetes. Okay. He's got a hump on his back. He's got a funny thing. He's got a facial substitution to the position that some of you would might recognize. And the reason for that is because HIV protease inhibitors, this has only been found out within the last two years, inhibit the glucose transport enzyme that takes glucose into the cells. Okay? If your pancreas right, is not seeing glucose, it's going to start secreting insulin. If your cells are not, if you, if you can't get glucose in your muscle cells, it doesn't matter whether they see insulin or not. Okay? You're insulin resistant. So here we have a case, and I think this is, well, I, I, having taught pharmacology for a while, I'm a pharmacological nihilist. Okay? I don't take anything unless I'm really hurting. Or my physician who tells me I absolutely have to. And my wife stuffs it down me every morning at breakfast. But in any case, every drug I know about have side effects. We don't make silver bullets. That's a myth. In this case, HIV proteases are not silver bullets. So one of the goals that some of us are trying to pursue right now is how can we design HIV protease inhibitors that don't inhibit glue four? Because obviously that would be a big advancement for the patient. We don't want to we don't want to stop people from developing age and at the same time develop diabetes. Okay, now we're going to take a total tangent for the more physical biochemist that might be in the room. And I'm going to tell you that if we talk about energy of binding, because that's something I'm really interested in, how can I predict how tightly my theoretical compound is going to bind to inhibit the enzyme? You know, I mean, Doing things on the computer, you can do them quickly. You may or may not believe it. Going to the lab and making some of these compounds is a major hassle. Okay. So you'd like to use the computer to prioritize which compound do I make first. But it turns out the energy of binding is divided into two parts. The first part is what we call the enthalpy of binding. And that's sort of like the standard thing. That's, you know, I take a hydrophobic root and I stick it in a hydrophobic. Or I take the charge group and I stick it next to a, a you know, positive charge and I stick it next to a negative. <coughs> That's sort of stuff we know about. Battery walls, interaction, electrostatics. We're pretty good at that. The problem we don't, we can't deal with very well is what's called, it's called the entropy of my okay. If I take a very flexible molecule, um, here in solution, and I've got a receptor over here, and I bind it, it's not flexible. That costs me energy. That's the part of the equation that we really are missing. And from these sorts of studies, we now know just how much you're missing. These are experimental data from a professor at Hopkins and Ernesto Freer, which basically shows you in blue what is the delta G or the free energy of binding of these inhibitors, HIV protease. It then dissects it based on that. Uh, isothermal titration calorimetry dissects it into delta H and delta S. P delta S is the matter. But the thing I want to point out to you is here we have two inhibitors, very potent inhibitors in terms of binding, but look at how the energy of interaction is distributed. In one case, delta S is huge. In the other case, it's not their health. It's all in delta H. And I can tell you from having done this experiment, looking at the crystal structures of those two inhibitors now to HIV protease, I cannot see anything that explains that difference. There is no visual way looking at the crystal structures of those complexes that I can tell you, that I can pick out which was which. It's just not visible. This basically just says what I'm trying to tell you. Well, there's an assumption 
here generally because HIV protease is the classic case where everybody that binds to it, the enzyme looks exactly the same. It is the classic case where we can make the assumption that the entropy of the enzyme doesn't change. And I don't know how many of you have had this experience that the best made assumptions are usually the ones that cost you the most. Because lo and behold, that's not true. What you see in the crystal structure, which is a consensus of everybody binds it the same and looks the same, is not what goes on in the solution. And I don't want to go into details, but I'll just give you an example. The compound on the far right is the one that came out of Warner Lambert that it binds in a totally unique way. You don't see that tetrahedral carbon here. In this case, there's your tetrahedral transition state and they right here. In this case, there's your tetrahedral transition state and they Darunavir is the latest HIV protease in ever to be approved. It was designed based on knowledge of all sorts of structures of mutants, enzymes of HIV, and how they interacted. And this was going to be the one that really was going to stop the development of resistance. Okay. Well, within two years, they had isolated from two different patients enzymes, HIV proteases, that were totally resistant. And they sequenced those two enzymes. What did they find? They found that in one case there were 18 mutations out of 99 residues. And in another case there were 21 mutations out of 99 residues. So clearly this was a big improvement, okay, because it took a lot more mutations for HIV proteins to be resistant. But it's not enough. And so the question is, what in the world is going on when you have so many different mutations? And here, you're mapping these mutations. You see, a lot of these mutations are way out here on the edge. This is the active site. A mutation like 82 or over here, or 84, that interact with the inhibitor, oh yeah, that's going to affect how well it binds. What in the world are these guys doing? That right now is my major, one of my major research areas. Is what in the world is going on? And it turns out I have a colleague at the University of Florida named Gail Panucci who did a very interesting experiment. I'm not going to explain the details if someone wants to ask about it later, that's fine. She basically put what's called a spin label, okay, on the loops. <coughs> the hair pins I told you pull down. And she can monitor what the distance is between those spins. Okay. So she's basically just looking at the loops and saying, how far apart are you? But she gets an instant measure of the distribution of distance. Okay. It's not time average, it's instant. And so what did Gail find? Gail found that depending on which inhibitor you put in, you got a different distribution of where those guys were. Was it flat up? Were both flats up? Were both flats down most of the time? That all relates to the entropy. So each of these inhibitors, okay, interacts with the different dynamic shapes of the enzyme in different ways. Well, that's good news because I think I understand what the problem is. The bad news is that's more complicated if you gave me all of the nationals, whatever it is, the biggest computer complex you know about, and multiply it by a thousand, I don't have enough compute power to deal with this problem. So now we're trying to figure out what tools can we develop that help us deal with the dynamics of the system so we can start to understand which inhibitor binds with this guy with the flaps up versus this guy with one flat up and one flat down versus whatever else is going on in the dynamics of the system. Okay, and just to show you um, this. this is our first effort. This is what we call normal mode analysis. 
You see the two loops up there? Right? And this basically just shows a breathing mode of that enzyme. Right? But if I play it again, which I may be able to, you will notice that those hairpins don't go down like that. They're still like this. Okay? I don't have any inhibitor, anybody in there to interact with. So this just says maybe we get some tools that will make this work. Maybe we can get our fingers into this. Okay. But what did we miss? What did the medicinal chemist tell us? There are all sorts of things the mammalian enzymes that these viruses have to interact with. The mammalian proteins don't change their structure. You know, we basically don't mutate within our bodies very often unless we have cancer or something, the sequence of our proteins. So that's, I think, where we should be targeting and people are trying to do that. And I don't know how much time I've already overgone, but I suspect that's very close. And so I want to end this. <coughs> again by talking about PD4 and CD5 because these are the proteins expressed on your white cells right, which the AIDS virus targets and it's those proteins that they interact with and it turns out that that explains an awful lot of what's going on with the pathology of AIDS. For example, Have you, do you know of an example of a knockout experiment in humans where a gene is eliminated in order to see something? You will not get that by your committee. <laughs> you know, that's not going to get approved. But nevertheless, it has happened. Right? One of the receptors for the HIV virus on macrophages, okay, has been eliminated in a certain patient population. And if you're in North, Northern European extraction, there's about I think, a 1% chance for a deletion of a segment of that protein which means it doesn't express. So if you're homozygous, that's 1.01 times 1.01, whatever it is. Very small number. So there's chances are there may be somebody in this room that will be resistant to getting AIDS. That's how this was found. There were a group of patients, I think most of them in San Francisco and voluntarily, who basically cohabited with HIV positive people, who shared needles with HIV positive people, who didn't get AIDS. And they started looking at these people and they found this mutation that they do not make and express a CXCR4, which is the co-receptor on your macrophages. Normally, okay, what happens is when you get infected, you get infected with a strain that is trophic, i.e. <coughs> binds to, to CXCR4. Your macrophages are infected first. You've still got your T cells around there, and you get an immune response, you wipe out the virus, you keep the virus suppressed, and at some stage, the virus mutates, and now we can start getting CXCR5, and I hope I have my close computer, which is on the T cells. Once the virus makes that tra transition between being able to affect macrophages and affect T cells, you then wipe out your immune system <coughs> and you develop an age. As I said, this can take anywhere from years, I mean, literally. Five, seven, so, if you want to take your chances, okay, maybe you're one of those lucky people that won't get AIDS through your macrophages. I will tell you, however, that there are cases of people who have gotten AIDS because they got people who had CX, CR5, T cell, trophic phage. They don't have to wait for the transition. Having that genetic thing doesn't help. But in any case, this was a great therapeutic target, right? We know that in the case of, and I, I have them back, CXCR5 is the one that, that is, uh, has the mutation. 
We know that if you knock out that protein in a mouse, you get no phenotype. If you knock out that protein in a human, you get no phenotype. It makes it a great therapeutic target. And CXCR4 is not quite as good because it has a lot of physiological roles that we can talk about. Okay, so this basically just tells you what I have. It tells you exactly what the receptor is, a 32 pair base lesion. Okay, now, maybe I'm just a contrarian because I said, uh huh, everybody's going to start working on CXCR. CX, CCR5, because that's the one we have the human rotation in, that's the one we know most people go when they get the virus. However, if you're going to have AIDS, being HIV positive is not so bad, except you're a threat to your fellow man. AIDS is a terrible disease. Okay. So can we block people that are HIV positive from going to AIDS? Can we develop inhibitors of the co-receptor interacting with the AIDS virus on T cells? And that's, that has its own problems. And again, this is a personal story, so I'm going to tell you the personal story. I was in a meeting in Europe, and uh, a guy named Eric Duclair from Belgium, who is the world's expert, I think he's tested millions of compounds as a killer of AIDS. He said, I'm going to tell you about the compound which has the best therapeutic ratio we ever had. This compound basically knocks out AIDS, and it doesn't touch cells. Best therapeutic ratio. I looked at it, and that's the structure I looked there, and I started laughing. Because I have enough chemists in me to recognize that that compound was made to bind metals. And it turns out when I started looking at it, it was made, actually made by a metal century company here called Johnson Manti, which is involved with platinum and palladium and all these other things. And I looked at it and I said, oh yeah, I, I can tell that. That's going to suck the zinc out of my zinc fingers. Going to start the iron out of my revenue by your duct taste. I mean, that's not going to have any side effects at all. Right? <laughs> because we all know metals are only involved in about 60 or 70 percent of enzyme catalysis. So, you know, having something to buy metals is clearly not going to be a problem. So I was sitting there snickering to myself. And once again, I, I'm enough of a realist to, you know, he's an experimentalist, he had data. We went back, we made this compound in my lab. We tested it. Okay. It's exactly as it said. Best therapeutic ratio against HIV and culture I've ever seen. I still do not understand why it doesn't kill cells. It certainly binds metals. But again, that's one of these discrepancies between naive theory and almost understanding what's going on and having experimental data. And actually, this, this compound was tested in humans, but it was tested in humans before they knew about the differences in the co-receptors. And so the clinical trials were done. This is the one patient who had the CXCR4 trophic strain. This is the one person who would expect to have an effect. And this is his viral load up here, okay? Along with his viral load. You give him the compound, you look at a drop, you stop giving the compound, and you get rebound. That's tremendous. Unfortunately, the four or five or six other patients they have were CCR5 trophic. This compound had no effect on them. Their BCs picked up their money, folded their tents, and left. And it's called, now not only do you have to have the compound targeted the right thing, you have to design your clinical studies for it. You have to ask the right questions. Getting a drug from theory into the clinics is non-trivial. And again, we've, there are several other things that work on this, and I will just show you. Yes, Virginia, we look a lot for three-dimensional patterns. How do different drugs interact with the same receptor? What does the receptor see? In this case, we think the receptors see these aromatic rings, see this Juanito group up here, and see this group up here. 
may or may not be true, but that then forms the basis of us designing new compounds to test that idea. Now when we can go and look at mutations and we can make models of receptor, it turns out that the two co-receptors are two couple protein receptors. We're starting to understand a lot about those. So, what conclusions do I want to make? Targeting the viral life cycle is an obvious strategy. I'm not convinced it was the best strategy we would have taken. Uh, as someone who sent off a few applications to both the Canadian and American National Health Services to target the main enzymes for HIV, which were summarily dismissed, sometimes you have to wait Okay, for science to catch up with what are good ideas. Uh, multiple approaches to vaccine development. Listen, there is no doubt that vaccines are going to go. But all you have to do is look at our record of flu vaccines and look at the fact that HIV mutates just as quickly or, or more quickly to realize that vaccine development has not been a great success. Okay, uh, I think there are a lot of efforts now to target the interaction between the virus and human receptors such as CXCR5, CCR5, and so on. That's going good. Okay, what's on the horizon? I didn't know I was going to thunderstorm on the horizon. But in any case, pharmacogenomics. This is perhaps one of the latest, greatest buzzwords. And since my university happens to have one of the genome centers, they can do the, if you have a new pathogenic bacteria, last year they could do it in a week, I think this year they can do the sequence, the genome sequence in a day. And it is phenomenal what that technology has done. They are talking very seriously about you and I having our our genome sequence done from the order of ten thousand dollars, and then you could see whether or not you do not express CC one five. You could figure out whether or not you're going to be resistant today. It's just by looking at your gene, and you could figure out a lot of other things eventually with translation of medicine. So I think that's that's really huge because it's going to help us to decide why some patients have problems with certain therapeutics, what sort of side effects they have, how we can tailor our medicines to the individual. Okay, how about the real issue? Can we cure someone who's HIV positive? To my knowledge, there's only been one example of that happening. There was a patient who had both AIDS treated well under control, and he also had leukemia. And his leukemia went, you know, they controlled it, and they went back, went the mission, they came back, and eventually they didn't have anything to treat with. It. So they said, we're going to have to do a marrow transplant. In order to do a bone marrow transplant, they did a whole body of radiation. They had a donor for him. So they basically wiped out all of his white cells, okay, gave him new white cells, and this guy to this day is a virus. That's the only case I know of where someone has been cured. And I can tell you if any of you have ever been around somebody that's had a bone marrow transplant, that's not a route that you can take. That's pretty horrific medicine. However, just within the last year, people have taken white cells from patients who are well under control, who don't express HIV virus at all, and they put them in the presence of histone deacetylase inhibitors. Histone deacetylase is something that's involved in epigenetics and controls expression of the genome. And it turns out the white cells from these patients who are not expressing virus suddenly start expressing virus. Now we've got a way of getting those latent cells who we can't detect from your normal cells to identify themselves. As I said, 
that this has only been in the test tube within the last two years, and I have no idea where it's going to go. But I will tell you, it's the only thing that I see on the horizon that gives us some hope for basically being able to cure people with HIV. Okay, uh, just to tell you, I love this quotation. We all know the reason universities have students is in order to educate the professors. That's by John Archibald Wheeler. He was the mentor of both Richard Feynman, who's a famous Nobel Laureate physicist, and another one of his students was a guy named Kip Thorne. Kip Thorne is sort of our answer to Stephen Hawkins. He's Mr. Black Hole of the United States, and they were both students of his. Uh, one of these people on this slide, you, you might be able to identify in the audience because the reflections that you might see. Uh, but this has been a great group, and they, you know, and everything I know, in effect, has been taught to me by people asking me quote unquote dumb questions. And one other little comment. You may know of William Obama. You may know of the principal person on him. When I want to know something, I go to Wikipedia. <laughs> okay. And Wikipedia tells me, India non sum multiplicanda sina necessitate, i.e., don't make more assumptions than you have to. Okay. That was good for William of Ockham in, I don't know, 1300 or something. He put that forward. And we all use that in science. Now, I guarantee you, if you send in a grant to NIH and you've got a few extra assumptions in there, you'll get it back. Okay? That is a rule of which we live. My experience, however, is going on the gravestone. Mother Nature never shaved the bottom tree. Nature finds ways to overcome problems. There is no intelligence design to my knowledge. I mean, every time I look at a biological problem, you know, we've got introns, we've got exons, we've got epigenetics, we've got this, we've got all these complex systems interacting. And I don't know of any engineer intelligent enough to design anything that could take a single cell and produce a baby. You know, that's just beyond me. So with that, I will stop. I'm happy to entertain questions, stupid or otherwise, and I thank you.
Uh, is there any relationship between the, the different energy distribution you mentioned in some compounds to their ability to cause side effects? Oh, goodness. Well, yeah. one of the great um, uh, holy grails for somebody interested in drug discovery is a compound which only interacts with one therapeutic target. Now, the probability of that is so close to zero. If you think about it, you know, I don't know how many, you know, what do we have? Something like 2400 express protein, or some, I don't remember what the number is, because it changes in the human genome. And it's 24,000. Uh, but in any case, the data shows that each one of those proteins interacts on the average with six other proteins. Okay. Okay. So you've got a lot of possible places to be, as the French would say, cephalotomage. We can throw wooden shoes, cephalos, into our cellular machinery, and it's hard to predict all the possible effects of that. Thank you very much. Thank you again.